Have you ever thought about how your personality can affect your business? Maybe you're introverted and you don't like all the attention on yourself all the time. Or maybe you're extroverted and you tend to make decisions quickly without thinking things through all the way. Well, in today's episode, we are interviewing Amy Wicks, where she shares her story, how she found her unique personality and the ones around her to grow her business. Let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Skill to Scale show. We are so excited to have you guys here. We are all about growing our skills and showing you how to scale your life, whether that's in business or faith or your family. And in today's episode, we have a special guest. We are so excited to have Amy Wicks with us today. Amy Wicks, just a little description about her. She is a certified faith-based business and life coach and she specifically helps women identify their frustrations, anxiety, and doubts, and things like that. And so we're going to dive into a bunch of things that I know that she knows a lot about, specifically even Enneagram and uh, business, and we'll, we'll jump into all of that. So I, she has best-selling books, she's got podcasts, and all sorts of that things like that. And so we'll dive into all that as well. Um, but I know Amy because of our my wife, and um, you know, early on, in, in ministry 20 years ago, I was big into personality uh, test and strength finders. And it really helped me serve the people that I was around because of communication and how they listen to con- my, my, the way I communicate and vice versa, but also the performance and all of that. So I took a big interest in it and helped me on uh, early on. And so when Christelle started telling me, my wife started telling me about the Enneagram, I knew nothing about it, but I was, uh, it did pique my interest. And then she told me about you. And uh, so I'm so excited to d- jump in on this. And maybe, Amy, you could just, you know, start us off by telling us a little bit of your story, but also what is the Enneagram? Because a lot of people, I still find it that a lot of people still don't know what that is. So maybe you can, you know, jump a little bit of your story and describe what is the Enneagram and and then we'll just ask more questions. How's that? Sounds great. I love it. And I love great. that I got to meet your wife because our girls, your daughter, your one daughter in the midst of a pack of boys um, is a dear, dear friend to my two girls who are around yeah. her age. So um, just really grateful to know your family. But yeah, I got I, I got into this uh, idea of podcasting and offering courses and coaching and different things like that because I I really felt a desire to speak to a message of intentional living. But that is so broad, right? So I knew that I had that inkling, and with that inkling and a nudge, it has just continued to evolve and grow over the last eight years. So I dipped my toes in the water of podcasting seven years ago, and the rest is history, where I've just had the opportunity to utilize tools like the Enneagram to build a coaching process and roadmap to help businesses, business owners and leaders, and to even just help the stay-at-home mom learn what her superpowers are, her get identify the weaknesses, right? The things like anxiety and overwhelm, frustration, and help offer a roadmap to help them walk through it. And with um, also the with through the lens of faith, because that is the most important thing. I really believe God called me to this. And the whole p- purpose is to, to build the kingdom of God. At the end of the day, Jesus is the one who has all the answers. Our heavenly father can mend all the mo- broken places, but it's really great to have these tools and resources, like you mentioned the Enneagram. So um, for me, kind of like you, you hear about the Enneagram and enough people tell you about it. You start Googling it. You're going, how do you even spell it? Right? <laughs> so right. Enneagram simply means nine diagram. So Ennea in Greek means nine and gram in, in Greek also just diagram picture description. So it's a typology that identifies nine different personalities at the surface. That's the core. That's the basics of it. It has actually been around for a really long time, but it's kind of had its moment the last 10 years or so, where especially Mm. gospel-centered people have been able to utilize this tool and apply gospel principles to help people get out of the personality frustrations that 
all of us find ourselves in. And this, similar to Myers-Briggs and different things, have, have helpful information to help us be able to adjust and make some changes in our communication styles, even decision-making, engagement with others to help us thrive in our relationships and work. So Enneagram does differ a little bit different than your typical typology, where it dials in the why, the why you do what you do, not just what you do. And I think that's an important piece to note as you explore the Enneagram. That's interesting um, because I, because my mom actually got me into Enneagram stuff like maybe three, four years ago. And she like made me do the test and all this stuff. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, because you're like really into the Enneagram stuff, how do you see uh, Enneagram stuff like really affecting your business and how it's helped you grow in your business and even helping others identify their strengths and weaknesses and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think for me personally, as a business owner, it has identified the things that are going to quickly cause me to um, to feel stuck. And I like to use the phrase, your starting point doesn't have to be your stuck point. And so the Enneagram has helped me identify some of those common pitfalls for my personality type. And it was a journey to discover what type I lead as and things like that. And as I've continued to be able to dive deep on my dominant type, I go, oh, yeah, um, the squirrel idea or shiny object syndrome, my personality totally lends itself to be getting distracted. Um, the yeah. person who starts something and doesn't finish again, a personality weakness and, tr and trait that I have to constantly remind myself, no, keep going. You can finish, you can complete that. You can do it with excellence. Um, my personality also struggles with focus, kind of what I alluded to in the first point, I can have lots of different plans instead of one plan. And so that's been a place of growth. It's also showed me that I am more of an assertive communicator. There's three different types of communication patterns or styles, and I fall in a category that is more assertive, which for as a woman, sometimes it can be surprising for some circles of people when I'm that assertive. And for other circles, it served me really well, because as an assertive person, I am more uh, just easily confident or outspoken and able to princept myself in a way that is gathering people. And another piece of it that's been very helpful is I've learned what kind of decision-making style I have. And there's also three different types mm. of decision-making styles. And I fit in the what is called the head <laughs> triad. And that has helped me understand where I go and make lots of plans. And I base my decision-making on strategy, on safety, on security. And that has helped me identify when I need to move from my head to my heart and then my gut and making a decision instead of overthinking, which I'm very, very prone to. So those have been really key, mm. obviously in business, but tell you what, I mean, if you hear some of those ideas, you imagine those help me with my relationships as well. Hmm. Yeah. Why don't we do something real quick? Because if no one's ever really heard about the Enneagram and they want to know like, well, where do I fit in? Uh, Cause I yes. think that was, that's probably for all of us. Like who, you know, what number would I be? Cause I know for me, I'm an eight and I have a couple other numbers, uh, seven, I think in uh, seven and five would be okay. uh, my yep. top three numbers. Um, okay. yes. What could you do something for us real quick and kind of just go through the nine and give a little description? Because if they've never heard what mm -hmm. that is, because, you know, it really helped me not only helped me for my own life, it, just like you said, it even helped other relationships like me and my wife and how do I communicate to my wife and, you know, and vice versa. Um, and even, you know, working with Michael, I, I know how to lean on his strengths that I don't have yeah. and, and so on. So maybe you could just give us a quick synopsis of the nine Enneagram scale. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to use is a template of three groups of three to go through it in a order that is going to be as hopefully understandable without looking at something. You can hear it and think through a diagram. Okay. So if you can picture with me a circle and the number nine is on top. There's no hierarchy in the Enneagram. So the nine is just simply it's the final number and it happens to be on top of the circle. But where we're going to begin today for description's sake is at the eight. And that's at the 
say 11 o'clock if you think about a clock. So we're going to talk about the 8, 9, and 1. The 8, 9, and 1 identify themselves in a group called the gut triad. When they are making a decision, they immediately, they don't think, they just instinctively know I must respond. It's a visceral somatic response and they find themselves responding. The eight tends to be more assertive out of that group of three and they often enjoy and appreciate a good challenge. They are more assertive in their communication style and they, they have a feeling, a, a very visceral feeling of who they need to protect, who they need to defend, what they need to challenge. The nine is a more of a withdrawing communication style. They tend to uh, back off and maybe go the other direction uh, in communication or in conflict. And they tend to want to um, keep a sense of peace and harmony and unity within themselves and also in their environment. They tend to, if they are healthy, they're going to bring stability um, in their peaceful making ways. And they are a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper, because a peacekeeper just turns their back on the situation and pretends it doesn't exist. Whereas a healthy nine is a peacemaker. A mm. one in this gut triad, they are a dutiful communication style. They tend to come alongside the situation. They have a very clear idea of right and wrong from a moral, from their moral compass. And they tend to insert themselves because they, when they see something that needs to be fixed, but they aren't going to assert themselves as much as say an eight would, because they're going to find out what will the group accept and what is the general norm of that group? What are they able to do? What do they find themselves having freedom to do? So that's the first three, eight, nine, and one. Okay. So now we're at about one o'clock if we look at the clock and now we're going to go to the heart triad the two, three, and four. Um, those, all, all three of those have a unique desire to find um, significance with others. And they tend to filter their decisions through a feeling. How do I feel about it? And how will others feel about me? This is a great distinguisher. And while all of us engage with our feelings, just as well, ever, everyone engages with their body and has a, eventually a somatic response, they're going to lead with that feeling. The two mm. leads with the idea of a dutiful response, just like the one they want to come alongside. They want to help. They want to be supportive. They want to do what people need from them. They instinctually go, oh, that person needs that help. And that person could probably use my support. I will insert myself in that way to come alongside and help them. They desire to know that they're wanted in situations and can quickly feel a little bit rejected if someone's like, no, no, I don't need your help. <laughs> and so then the three, the three is more assertive in their communication style. They are a little bit more, more gregarious, easily put themselves out there. They are often looking for the most efficient path to success, the quickest mm. path to success. They, they don't mind, um, uh, kind of giving their own shout outs. And they also, when they're healthy, they love giving shout outs to other and encourage that they have been, they quickly see, mm. like I said, that path to success. And when they're healthy, they love helping others find that path to success. And then you have mm. the four, the with the four in the heart triad is in the more withdrawing stance. So they might tend to pull back and engage internally with their feelings. How do I feel about this? The four desires a sense of belonging in their spaces and with their people. And so they're really good at engaging with the feelings of others. And they do have that sense of wanting to come alongside and help people with their feelings, to be able to name them, to explore them. And Fours don't mind sitting in sad or hard feelings, whether it's theirs or someone else's. <laughs> they have that superpower and that's that's a really neat, but they might be less likely to assert themselves in it. They, they're they going to wait maybe for a little bit more permission to do that. Okay, and then we have the last group of three. And these three fit in the head triad, the five, six, seven. They're very motivated by security, safety, a plan. They're very focused on strategy. The five fits in the more withdrawing stance where they're going to pull back a little bit and be more cerebral. 
They're going to be more internal with their processing, creating plans, making plans. But in their withdrawing stance, they sometimes struggle with following through with the plans, finding the momentum and the inertia. The five will often um, have a little less energy, if you will, throughout the day. They'll be more focused on how can they recharge. They, they don't mind engaging with others, but they're going to be a little bit quicker to find a place to pull out, you know, pull away and recharge um, and take in information and do the things mm. that will fuel them up a little bit to be able to give their output. And then you have the six. They come as more the dutiful. Again, they like to come alongside their group and their community, and they love to find the, the different plans for safety. They're really good troubleshooters. They're incredibly incredibly loyal and they're committed to their people. They're also going to maybe struggle with a little bit more anxiety than the five or the seven when it comes to their desire for safety and security. They tend to be a little bit more hyper vigilant and they're going to be proactive of making a plan, an escape plan or a protection plan again for themselves and for their community. And then you have the seven, last but not least, <laughs> and that's where I fit in, where also in that head type, but more assertive, less of afraid to insert and share the plan, also struggles with having many plans. The desire for the seven is to have as little limitations as possible and as many options and experiences as possible. And that mm -hmm. is part of their drivenness and the assertiveness is to uh, to grow friendships and grow opportunity. Um, and that's why someone like me, when you say, hey, you want to do a podcast? I'm like, sure, sounds like fun. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully that gives you, there's so much to say about them. Hopefully that gives you a clear, concise way to identify all the nine types. Yeah, so the reason I, I liked hearing what I just heard was, um, and some people are going to, you know, like, oh, I, I, I you know, I learned more about me on that, on that area and that area. And so what I liked about that is it's more than just, I'm an extrovert or introvert. I'm loud or yeah. I'm quiet. And I think that's where most people kind of start out to figuring out I'm just an introvert or extrovert. And there's much more to it than that. So I really value this and I appreciate it immensely. And in fact, I even look at it for even my own kids because they all have yeah. different backgrounds and all that. So it's more than just for business or ministry or my, even for marriage, but also for my kids to learn more about them. So I probably have learned more about my kids through the Enneagram than anything else. That's and amazing. So I've appreciated it I immensely. But I would love to kind of back, go go back a little bit because I, I loved what you just did. But how did you get into coaching? And, you know, did you trip over this? Because we get a lot of people that we're talking to, helping them with their online businesses and online coaching and courses and stuff like that. And, you know, people are pivoting, you know, mm -hmm. more than ever, they're pivoting. Maybe it's because of what took place in 2020 or what's taking place with the government and so on. Um, and so they're taking their knowledge, their expertise, and they're going to online coaching a lot of times. Now, there might even be going into another direction of business, but maybe you could tell us a little bit of your story, how, you know, you've been You've been podcasting for seven years. You told us that it's your seven year anniversary on Sunday. So can you just give us a little background on how did you get into doing this? Yeah. Okay. If you want to know the real story, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> I, Let's do that. All right. Well, I grew up in the ministry and went from being a kid in ministry to an adult in ministry pretty quickly. And as a um, young woman in the 90s, uh, you know, kind of hint at my age here, um, there wasn't a whole lot to do with the desire for ministry in my social arena than marry a pastor, which I said I would never do, or um, or to be an assistant at some church or to be a missionary. Um, but I knew I loved discipleship and mentorship, and I was whether I was the oldest of four kids and the pastor's kid, I don't know. I just was always naturally inclined to support people, even who were older than me. Um, and maybe I was born old. I, I, you know, all of those factors. But I think from early on, I knew I had this call on my life. Well, uh, you know, insert a lot of sad 
um, hard difficulties in the ministry, to be honest with you. Um, I ended up just becoming a, a lay person who was in real estate and who did discipleship on the side and involved with the church at some level. And so lots of different businesses, entrepreneurships through early years of marriage and then having three kids, three kids in three and a half years left me with like, I was making bread, I was doing medical billing, I was doing all sorts of different things and always this discipleship on the side. So when I, I think this would have been 2015 or so, I really started feeling restless. I had a home-based business selling cloths and cleaning supplies. And then I also was doing this medical billing and raising three kids and homeschooling. But I just felt this nudge to, to do something a little bit more and also something that would provide income for my family and also being this like this new phase of my life that I could begin to work a field that really added more meaning to my life and was part of this long term what I felt was vision and call. And so I heard about a business conference called the Business Boutique, and it was led by Christy Wright under the Dave Ramsey uh, group. And when I oh, yeah. heard about it, it was one of those, I just knew that I knew that I had to get there. And it was like $100 and a trip to Texas. And I, I knew it would take a little bit of talking through my husband of going, no, like, I know that I know that the Lord wants me there. Long story short, I ended up making the trip with my mother-in-law because I wanted to help her reignite some passion for a ministry that she had had for years and mm. a, a message on intentional parenting in the summertime. So I went there thinking I'll get re-energized for my Norwex business and, you know, I'll help my mother-in-law. It'll be this amazing thing. And it was an amazing thing. Interestingly enough, as I sat there, I felt in my spirit like a spiritual mantle shifted from my mother-in-law's shoulders to my shoulders of this intentional parenting message. It, mm. it is not like an experience that I have had previous. It was so unique and distinct, but clear as about, I can still feel that experience in my mind, if you will, as I think back on it. And then the rest of the time, I still have the notebook from that conference. I was writing these ideas about podcasting and interviewing amazing women and having online courses and all these things that I wasn't really familiar with, but I just was having these crazy downloads. Now, I could not have imagined in a million years, fast forward eight years later, what things look like now or where I would be going. But that was really the start of it and this direction of exploring, you know, how can I come alongside my mother-in-law? Very, very long story short, um, lots of twists and turns in the process. I did take on that message for her because she wanted to reach retire and quilt and just, you know, live a more relaxed style. She wasn't interested in um, doing the work involved necessarily that I was suddenly feeling passionate about. So she blessed me with that. And as I began to work with more moms intentionally in my church, and then also just through um, expanded community because of all the different places I lived and the benefits of being online, I kept coming back to this reoccurring thing where moms were really doubting of their call or doubting because being a mom was so hard for them compared to their friend or sister or neighbor that maybe they weren't cut out to be a mom. And why was motherhood uniquely frustrating for them? So that's really where the Enneagram came in, where I felt the Enneagram specifically gave some of the pain points, the motivations, the fears, the struggle, the core struggles that they could finally name and identify that was unique to them. And then they could see, listen, this is how God wired you. This is how God made you. There's nothing wrong with you. And just because this is your struggle and it's not your friend's struggle, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. And there is a pathway through. The answer is found in the gospel. The answer is found with what the Lord gave us and understanding therapy and tools and soul care obviously the word of God being a big theme of it. And so I decided to go ahead and get certified in Enneagram so I could learn from a perspective of the coach. Um, and so your Enneagram coach is a well-known uh, gospel center platform that certifies coaches. But at that time, when I was going through that, it was a big price tag to get their roadmap, if you will. And so it forced me to create my own roadmap. So 
as I would mentor women in my living room, literally week in and week out with inexpensive childcare and food and coffee. And in one room, you know, kids are going crazy over here, tearing everything up. Um, but in this other room, 20 plus women, we would sit and go through the struggles and identify all these different things. And what I was doing was group, group coaching. I didn't know it. And, but in the process, I was able to see, walk them but through things. But that was in where person. So all this was in person yeah. coaching. Yes, wow. it was in person. And then, and then like kind of how everything eventually evolves here where one person tells this person and they live in another state. And so you want to help them. And then obviously I had the podcast as well. And so that was just an opportunity to share what was going on and where people could say, Hey, I'm interested in that. Could you help me with that too? So tell me the biggest challenge because here, I, I want to talk about, I like talking about people's journey when they're pivoting. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge? I know you you mentioned the price tag of going into a coaching program and things like that. Um, what was your biggest challenge that you felt, oh man, this is so hard. I want to make it maybe easier for someone. Because uh, a lot of times those pain points is how we serve other people. I know that's what yes. I do. Um, so maybe you could tell us like, what was some of those beginning challenges because we love helping new entrepreneurs. Of course, we even help, you know, already, you know, really well set up, set up uh, business leaders. And we have a done for you service and stuff like that. So we were engaging both kinds. But for those who are just starting or thinking about starting or pivoting into, mm -hmm. you know, another area, what was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome that? Yeah, I would... I would start off with this and we'll work our way backwards. But okay. I think what it takes is to take Eugene Peterson saying it's a long obedience in the same direction or persistence, persistence, persistence. And so I would just speak to the, the woman or man who is starting out in business and it, it feels overwhelming or it feels like it's taking longer than it should. And I want to assure that you are doing the right thing. You are exactly where you are. And if you believe you're called, you are called. You're not mistaken. Just because the outcome doesn't match your expectation in the timeline. Okay. So I just want to say that because That's that so was often, yeah, that was often the hardest thing, Antonio, because if the Lord gives you a dream and if you're a forward thinker and you see this vision, you think it should be in a few months when sometimes it might take a few years. So over time, kind of as you've mentioned, mm. I, I love to learn. And so I would learn from this person and that person and this person and that person. But Antonio, you know this. There are so many different ways to build a business. So I would confuse myself by listening to the wrong guru or a conflicting guru. And I think pretty quickly I want to encourage just choose like two or three people in business that you admire or respect and follow their methodology and just stick to that one methodology. As I said, I like to, I see lots of plans. I like to do lots of things, but my problem is I would hear this person. I'd think, oh, I need to build a course. And then I hear this person, oh, I need to build social media. And then we hear this person then, oh, I need to do group coaching or one-on-one -on -one coaching or, you know, so, so eventually I have done those things, but it's one step at a time. So find the person who you most admire and respect and you want to grow into, not be like, but grow into and follow the step by step plan that they are offering to help you to get from A to Z. Which Antonio, you know, I, I've told you is that that's now what I'm doing a lot of times is coaching coaches because I want to offer to them what I wish I had over seven years ago of, hey, this is the roadmap that you can follow, whether you have no money or a little bit of money and whether you feel like you have zero expertise or you have a little expertise where we can take you from A to Z and build a sustainable business that they love. Well, Amy, why don't you... Uh because of the the pivoting things that you've done and and uh because i fully agree with you there's so many voices out there in fact you got to cut through the noise um and i couldn't agree more that picking two or three in fact picking two or three seems to me like a lot i would pick yeah. one for a season mm -hmm. and i would have a you know a number two or a number three after i finished a season 
because you want to follow and implement, like you said, their methods. And really, I'm I'm after more than just, you know, little bits. I'm actually after systems. Yes. And I think the, the implementation of a system and even growing myself into that system so that I know it uh, has been critical for us. And it's how we coach as well. Um, and then there's going to be another person or another another system that you can implement in your in your business as well, whether that's social media or, you know, ad purchases and a lot of people, you know, the, or email marketing and all these things are so new that mm -hmm. I don't recommend to be having two of them going at the same time. I think mm -hmm. that can actually hurt you. I think having the, the, the system, you know, this one set up and then going to the next one and the next one and the next one. So what have you found has been a game changer system, if I could say that type of terminology, mm -hmm. a game a game changing system that you've implemented that you've seen help your business? Yeah, what I stand by and teach is focus on building your email list. I feel like this is the foundation. And now we take one step back usually because a lot of my coaches feel overwhelmed about like, well, how do I have an email list? What are the platforms? What are the systems, right? And so we talk through a basic, I call it five by five, which is like you create your list of circles that you have, communities you've already built up, relationships, maybe even over the decades. And you continue to build that list on a regular basis of just writing down names. And you use those names to reach out to and tell them about this business that you're starting and the service that you're offered. And there's different conversations and methodologies with that. So like, that's the very basic, right? It's building a community, what I like to call a gathering space. And with that idea, if we're thinking about a gathering space and, you know, we're getting to like, host something really beautiful, you want to start off by telling people. And now sometimes if you have local people, you can just tell them and invite them, but then you need to take that next step. And if you want to reach people outside of that local circle, you need to create an invitation. And the invitation is simply you, you know, a landing page with a special freebie and offer that will support your people and help them know a little bit more about you and your gathering place that you're building. And so we go through that process of, of um, creating that, that unique uh, resource to them that helps give people a little bit more of a flavor of what they're offering. Just like if you're hosting um, a dinner with a bunch of people, are you going to be serving tacos or pizza? Is it an Italian night or um, is it, you know, a, uh, Thai food, um, those kind of distinguishers as we think through what that invitation looks like to be a really good representation of what people can expect. Um, because we're not going to be hosting a buffet. And so that helps people get really clear on dialing in on that one thing. And we just go through from there. And so I feel like even with all these years of business, I still go back to those personal contacts, the personal one on one conversations. And, and over time, you can begin to scale that. And like you said, build in and add other systems. So that way you can eventually be uh, reaching more people, gathering a bigger community. But all of that takes time and money. But I really believe you can start at the very beginning with the people you know, the email addresses you have. And through that, grow a business that will provide income. That's super good. I really like uh how you're taking someone from A to Z in business. Um, I want to transition the topic a little bit to marriage and the Enneagram, because this is something I've always wondered, because um, I'm kind of like, like my Enneagram, I'm a seven, five. So I'm always okay. thinking about like, uh, how can we have fun? But then like, when I'm thinking about something, like I'm thinking about all the systems, how the things that can make it work. And then when I'm thinking, I'm kind of in my own world. Like I don't even like hear when someone's talking to me and my wife, she's a two. So she's like always helping. She's always wanting to be understood. How can she help? How can I help? And it's something we've grown in into each with each other. But how would you say, this is the question I was wondering, how would you say um, as a husband, because we actually have a lot of male viewers yes. as a husband, how can I look at my wife's Enneagram? and then help her in that area. Uh, that's so good. 
And I always say the most important thing is that you work on your individual self-awareness by getting mm. really clear on the things that the Enneagram can help us name core desires, mm. longings, fears, weaknesses. And when we begin to work those through those in a spiritual direction manner, where we're getting those needs met from the Lord, our perfect father, we suddenly begin to shift our thinking where we're not getting our, we don't have to get our needs met from our spouse because we're getting our needs met here. And from that, mm. then we can with health express to our spouse you know, kind of an interesting thing I've learned about myself is that I want to know that I'm taken care of. It's a high value to me. And this is what being taken care of looks like. And so those become healthy conversations instead of you need to take care of me <laughs> or like you have to understand that I value safety and security and you need to provide that for me. So that comes from such a, a healthier place. And I do work with a lot of couples where one spouse is way more excited about the self-awareness journey than the other. And so like anything else, leading by example, sharing your personal experience and finding is so much more attractive to the spouse who's a little uncertain of how this tool might be used against them. We want to promote a conversation. Are you talking, of like, hey, are you talking the Enneagram tool specifically? So in that marriage uh, that, you know, they maybe, maybe you could dive into this a little bit. So will someone, once they learn their tool, that the Enneagram, you think it could be used against them, maybe in a conflict or in another issue in their marriage? Is that what you're meaning? Yes. Yeah, sometimes we can use it as a sword or as a shield because we don't want to use it mm -hmm. as an excuse for poor behavior. That's not cool. And we don't want to use mm -hmm. it as a shield to block of like, well, you can't expect this from me because that's not just how I am. Right. They never change. They, 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 they kind of lean on that. Is that, so do you see that? So uh, we're really good friends with Bob and Audrey Meisner. And in fact, uh, we did a marriage uh, retreat with them and they actually take people through the Enneagram uh, so great. For, for their marriage stuff yeah. um, to help marriages out. Yes. So do you see a lot of that even in marriage, like um, they lean on as an excuse of not changing or not serving the other person uh, with the Enneagram? Have you seen that a lot? It definitely kind of that that same thing, right, where our starting point doesn't need to be our stuck point. It's reminding everybody it's an identifier, but we don't have to keep those unhealthy coping mechanisms or just because we tend to be one communication pattern doesn't mean we we don't have access to the others, right? I believe right, yeah. if we're made in the image of God, who is the perfect all nine and more, then we mm -hmm. have accessible through the power of the Holy Spirit in us and the fact that we're made in the image of God to exude all the qualities. Just because I'm not a natural peacemaker doesn't mean that I can't engage with my peacemaking gift because that is ultimately the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So it is, it is such a powerful tool, Antonio, because I've also been um, certified in marriage and family. I think it's an incredible tool, as you mentioned, like with kids and parents, husband and wife. And it's so great when all parties can come together, learn about themselves. And then, Michael, kind of go back to you. What you can do is be a student of your wife, just as your dad mm -hmm. has been a student of his kids and go, okay. Um, you know, it sounds like your wife is pretty fluid with Enneagram, likes it, embraces it too. But what you can do is read about, okay, what makes her tick? What are her desires? What are her core longings? How can I mm. show up as a husband who can, who is looking to speak to those and affirm her that you want her and you need her before she does all the things for you? You want her just for you. So little things like that, man, you know, like that can just an explode a relationship in such a powerful way where the, the closeness and, and shared interest is just going to like, just make a marriage thrive. Love that. Super good. So good. Well, I had another question and, and, um, and this is more for business and entrepreneurship. What would be one piece of advice? Cause I, I did like that very much where you shared that, you know, to pick the two or three things. I, I appreciate that very much where, cause yeah. it, you know, especially in the online space, there's so many shiny objects to go on, go into. Um, and it's a temptation for everyone. We should try that yes. strategy. We should try that thing and do that. And 
And I think everyone who's, especially if they're starting out, they're going to, they're going to want to dip their toes in all of it. Yeah. Um, and I like that. I think, I think there's, there's value to that. Uh, but I just don't see a business growing too strong with so many shiny objects in front of them. You got to totally. pick. I remember one time I was with John Maxwell and it was a private meeting uh, with me, one other person. And we were kind of pitching to him how he could be involved. And okay. it, it was four hours of talking to him. Wow. And in those four hours, you know, he listened, he learned, he was taking down notes. And then towards the last hour, he just stopped the meeting and he said, well, I just do one thing. I'm pretty simple. He said, mm -hmm. I just do, I teach leadership. So I yeah. appreciate all the things you've been talking to me about, but I only do one thing. So how can I serve and help you with the one thing that I do? And that was a big lesson to me, especially mm -hmm. helping other people start, focus on the one thing, do it well, grind it out, go through the reps, because there's so many different plays, like you mentioned earlier, there's so many different plays, so many different ways to do it. Um, and so I really value the one thing for a season. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not distraction and you get really good at it. And you can actually right. say, I really, because I, I hear a lot of people, I tried that, it doesn't work. I right. tried organic following. It doesn't work. No, you just didn't stay there long enough for it right. to work. And right. most of the time it's, and I, I want to put it back on you, but most of the time it's, it's, it's working on me before it's working on my business. And, uh, and then it's going to overflow and reap, you know, reap, mm -hmm. uh, you know, benefits and rewards later on. But maybe you could tell us, what would be the one thing, piece of advice that you would give a new entrepreneur who maybe feels stuck or, you know, wants to pivot, you know, the mm -hmm. journey that you did, what would be the one thing that they could actually take and, and you could give them some advice? Yeah. Well, mm, one thing, right? That's always so hard. <laughs> I mean, you could pick um, a couple, you could pick two or three as well, but you know, I like the one thing that really yeah. could help a new entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I would kind of actually touch on what kind of couple what you said, and then also going back to the persistence and the long obedience in the same direction. And the question to ask yourself before you pivot or before you give up is, have you really tried it long enough? Like you said, most of the things we do because we either get bored or we think it should work in this amount of time when really it takes this amount of time. Because sometimes I think we give up or pivot when we're this close to a shift. And on our instant society where people do sometimes are overnight successes, but does it really last long or is it too much too soon? We, we all know people who burn out quick and had the rise to fame and it wasn't healthy for them. So if you really wanna do this thing long-term Go back and settle with yourself. Did I really give it enough time? Am I willing to get to go move past the boredom? Maybe you feel with it and to give it a little bit longer, especially if you have access to training already. You don't have to invest any more money. You already have sound counsel. You have the roadmap and the plan, the proven plan. Continue to do that and exhaust it until you know that you know that you or it's time to move on to something else. So it is really too quick, you know, even myself, it's just really easy to think, oh, I did this for six months and it didn't quite have what I, or do what I thought it would do when I really just needed to give it a year or two years even. Um, obviously, if you're losing money and you can't pay your bills, you know, like th that's a totally different conversation. But if it's just not as big as you think right. it should be because of your hard work, Give it time. Like I'm like John Maxwell is a perfect example, right? How many years has he been in the leadership space? He's and he hasn't burned out. He hasn't been this like a flame woman out the next. Like he consistently and he, all those years, he has something really substantial to look forward to. And I much rather lean into that model than any sort of overnight success that lasts for a few years and then it's gone. Well, I had a, you know, Michael and I uh, on the, on the same conversation you, you were just sharing actually right before you came on, Michael la was actually talking to me about this same thing. A lot of people don't stay the course. They don't, they don't persist. Mm -hmm. Um, would love, you know, Michael, you were just sharing with me something that you learned about 
some people need to learn and then they need to execute. Why don't you, you know, jump into that because I think it actually adds to this conversation. Someone who's just starting out and uh, they quit too early. And I know the financial side of things. I, I also think, man, there, if you have a call that you feel this, uh, you know, part of it is gut and part of it is a call. And I kind of mix those two things. Um, and you were telling me about the learners and the, the executors, Michael, and I forget the terminology, mm -hmm. but maybe expand on that because I'd like to build on that. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much I was I was listening to this interview, how this guy started in business. He's a Christian guy. Um, and he was saying that he usually sees there's two type of people in business. There's like an executing person and then there's like a learning person. And mm -hmm. I've even seen this with like me and dad's relationship where I would say I'm more of like learner thinking and then dad's like executing, right? So the yeah. leaning of each person, the executor is like, oh, they see a good idea and then they just go and do it really quick. And then the learning type person's like, they see a good idea, then they learn everything about it, and then they just keep learning, right? Yeah. And so the guy was saying, what we need to do is we need to be a learner, we need to learn as much as we can, and then we need to execute. And the reason why you need to do this is because either of those two people, they get stuck in their two sections and they fail. So yeah. even when you were saying with uh, persistence, like even with our own business, what I've seen is if you just keep going and just keep trying at that one thing, you're going to get better at whatever you're doing. I've even seen this when I did TikTok a year or two ago. At the beginning, when I started posting videos, um, I'd get like maybe a thousand views and I'd be like, oh, sick, I got a thousand views. But then I was like, I'm just going to post three times a day and see what happens and not really care about the numbers. And then boom, it just starts blowing up 20,000 views, 30,000 views, 300,000 views. And then it grows. And it was because I wasn't worried about this result mm -hmm. that I had in my mind. And I really feel like it builds on to like expectation is your actual superpower. If you can mm -hmm. not use expectation in terms of, oh, I got to hit this goal at this certain amount of time and just worry about I'm going to do something repetition and just keep going like you were saying, Amy, then yeah, that's what I think would really mm -hmm. help a lot of people in business is just pick something and just go. So what so did, have you have you noticed someone making a decision when they're just starting out? Have you helped them make a decision? Because I, I also notice because I've done so many sales calls, like <laughs> probably thousands. OK, yeah. And I, I noticed some people are ready to go shiny object and they haven't even counted the cost fully. And right. some people um, and then other people, their their analysis paralysis, you know, they yep. want to. I, I've had so many people who are like, they're ready to go, but uh, I don't know. And, you know, and so the, there's analysis paralysis types of people. What have you, you know, encountered to help people make a decision, jump over, um, just like you have, just like we have, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of people want to, but their ducks are not in a row. There's no perfect timing. The money is not yeah. all there. You know, the, the, the situation, the circumstances and all of that. What have you seen to help people overcome the analysis paralysis, but also all the ducks in a row are not there? Yeah. And I think it goes back to, and this is where I feel like there is a, a, a very short list. Usually I have five questions to your point, Antonio, right? In those calls and exploring a decision, there's usually five questions that we ask. And I think it helps um, because none of them are about ducks in the row. They're just like the critical things that you have to have in place before taking that step. And that has helped filter, I believe, people's, it, it takes down that obstacle and that barrier of analysis. Because then we go, last but not least, the last question is like, what's the worst thing that could happen if you say yes and nothing happens? And, and so by going down that, that path and going, because we've answered these other things and we go, we're like, oh, actually, financially, we'll be okay. We'll not be where we want to be, but we'll be okay. My, my relationships will be intact. I will have gotten to learn something that I'm excited about. And I know I believe in it because I've experienced the transformation. And so then that last question is like, oh, and then they go, that worst case scenario, it's not actually that bad. I think I could go ahead and go for it and do it. 
Well, Amy, thank you so much for spending a little time with us. Um, maybe you could just verbally tell us, because we're going to put it in the descriptions, how they can get a hold of you and connect with you and all of that. Yeah. Uh, and I know that you have a, a great book out there, Should Christians um, Use the Enneagram? Um, where can they buy that? How they can connect with you? Maybe verbally just share that with us real quick. Yeah, I love to get to meet new folks on Instagram. That's my more favorite social place to hang out. Um, once you follow me at Wholehearted Enneagram, um, eventually within a day or two, I'll send a real human greeting of like, welcome, I'd love to get to know you more. And then um, you can absolutely find, uh, should Christians use the Enneagram on Amazon? So Kindle edition is free. Uh, no audio book version yet, but that's where you can instead uh, um, get the book and listen to my podcast at Simply Wholehearted. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you again for spending a little time with us and um, really appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing your journey as well. Grow and build your business. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Have a great thank one. Thank you so much. It's